Welcome to Come Follow Me, New Testament, week four. Today we're dealing with John chapter one from the seminary manual. The apostle John wrote this book. Throughout the book, he referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. John and his brother James were fishermen. Before becoming disciples and then apostles of Jesus Christ, John was apparently a follower of John the Baptist. During a time of increasing persecution against Christians, growing apostasy and disputations about the nature of Jesus Christ, the Apostle John recorded his testimony. Although John's writings are meant for everyone, his message also has a more specific audience. Elder McConkie wrote, The Gospel of John is the account for the saints. It is preeminently the Gospel for the Church. John stated that his purpose for writing this book was to persuade others to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. The scenes from Jesus' life that John describes are carefully selected and arranged with this object in view. About 92% of the material is not found in other Gospels. This is probably because of John's intended audience, church members, who already had an understanding of Jesus. And it's decidedly different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke's intended audience. Of the seven miracles reported by John, five are not recorded in any other gospel. While Matthew, Mark, and Luke present considerable information about Christ's ministry in Galilee, John recorded numerous events that took place in Judea. John's gospel is richly doctrinal, with some of its major themes being the divinity of Jesus as the Son of God, the atonement of Christ, eternal life, the Holy Ghost, the need to be born again, the importance of loving others, and the importance of believing in the Savior. John emphasized Jesus' divinity as the Son of God. John recorded over a hundred of Jesus' references to his Father, with over 20 references in John 14 alone. One of John's major contributions is his inclusion of the Savior's teachings to his disciples in the hours before his arrest including the great intercessory prayer offered the night he suffered in Gethsemane. This portion of John's account represents over 18% of the pages in John, providing us with a greater understanding of the Savior's doctrine and what he expects of his disciples. Early Christian writers of the second century suggest that John wrote this book in Ephesus, which is in modern Turkey. Proposed dates for the writing of the Gospel of John range from A.D. 60 through A.D. 100. It's likely that John wrote his gospel after he had already authored the book of Revelation. From Elder Bruce R. McConkie, regarding John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, from a Latter-day Revelation, we learned that the material is the forepart of the gospel of John and was originally written by John the Baptist. Even without revelation, however, it should be evident that John the Baptist had something to do with the recording of events in the forepart of John's gospel. For some of the occurrences include conversations with the Jews and a record of what was said when our Lord was baptized, all of which matters would have been unknown to John the Apostle, whose ministry began somewhat later than that of the Baptist. There is little doubt but that the beloved disciple had before him the Baptist's account when he wrote his gospel. The Gospel According to St. John, Chapter 1. Just to begin with, I'm going to tell you a significant portion of John was changed in the GST. Joseph Smith made some huge changes to it, and there's so many that they can't even be included on our regular page, so they're placed in an appendix. Also, if you look at Doctrine and Covenants 93, which I suggest you do as you're studying Chapter 1 of John, it contains a lot of insights there. The other Gospels start with Christ's life, but John chooses to start with the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is a very controversial statement that has caused a lot of controversy throughout the ages. So let me show you what my research has discovered. The Greek word logos means something said, including something thought. Also, reasoning or motive, the divine expression, meaning Christ. It can also mean communication, intent, reason, speech, utterance, word, and even work. 
when we use the term the word, it's confusing for us in English. From Raymond Brown, the gospel according to John, he writes this concerning the early Greeks. It was the force that originated and permeated and directed all things. When John uses the term logos, he used a term that would be widely recognized among the Greeks. But to us, when we say the word word, it, it doesn't have the same significance. The average man might not know its precise significance to the philosophers any more than his modern counterpart knows what the scientist understands by saying something like nuclear fission. But he would know that it meant something very important. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity springs from this comment in John. And it's the central dogma concerning the nature of God in most Christian churches. It defines one God existing in three co-equal, co-eternal, divine persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons sharing one essence. Each is God complete and whole. But when you go through and you read the catechisms that have been produced, or if you look at the creeds, the Nicene Creed, all of the creeds that came after that, this idea of the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but the Father is not the Son, it's not God, it's not the Holy Spirit. This confusion that comes because of this verse is incredible. If you compare it to, for example, the living Christ, which was released by the apostles, there's a stark difference between what they're saying and what we believe. So let's jump in. I'm going to move between the Joseph Smith translation and the regular King James version of John 1. This is the JST. In the beginning was the gospel preached through the Son, and the gospel was the Word, and the Word was with the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was of God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, but without him was not anything made which was made. President Nelson used this term when he said, under the direction of the Father, Jesus bore the responsibility of creator. His title was the Word, spelt with a capital W. In the Greek language of the New Testament, the word was logos, or expression. It was another name for the master. The terminology may seem strange, but it is appropriate. We use words to convey our expressions to others. So Jesus was the word or expression of his father to the world. From the Institute Manual, Latter-day Revelation provides additional information about the title of Jesus Christ. In the beginning, the word was, for he was the word, even the messenger of salvation. The Gospel of John emphasizes that Jesus Christ is the messenger of the father to the world. As such, he declares the father's words. From Eric Hudsman. Logos in Greek represents not only spoken words, but also the ideas behind the words and hence the means by which one person conveys his thoughts to another or puts his ideas into effect. So if you take in what I've just tried to explain to you and you do some substitution, you could read John 1.1 like this. In the beginning was the plan and the plan was with Jehovah and the plan was Jehovah. So I think what John's trying to tell us is that Christ is everything. Without him, none of this would work. John is absolutely testifying of the necessity for Jesus Christ. Okay, moving along. Verse 4 and 5, I'm going to read the JST because it makes it a little bit more clear. In him was the gospel, and the gospel was the life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the world, and the world perceived it not. The first five verses of John 1 are almost poetic. It's like a poem. And then it breaks away into these three verses that are like prose that kind of explain what's going on. And then it goes back into this poetic form. So verse 6, 7, and 8. Verse 7, I'm going to substitute the JST for. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came into the world for a witness, to bear witness of the light, to bear record of the gospel through the Son unto all that through him men might believe. He was not the light, 
but was sent to bear witness of that light. From President Hunter. After quoting John 1, 6 through 8, he explained that these passages describe the purpose of John's ministry. The immediate purpose of the mission of the Baptist was to bear witness that Jesus was the true light, the true teacher of the way of life eternal, and to invite men to believe in him for the remission of their sins and be baptized. John the Baptist was not the Messiah or the leader of a great movement. He was the herald and witness bearing testimony to the nature and divine titles of Jesus and the witness through whom God attested the divine sonship of Jesus. Verse 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now every man, you can see the subscript C, that refers to Doctrine and Covenants 8446. The Spirit giveth light to every man that cometh into the world, and the Spirit enlighteneth every man through the world that hearkeneth to the voice of the Spirit. The phrase light of Christ does not appear in the Bible, although the principles that apply to it are frequently mentioned therein. From the Institute Manual, the light of Christ is just what the words imply. Enlightenment, knowledge, and an uplifting, ennobling, preserving influence that comes upon mankind because of Jesus Christ. For instance, Christ is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The light of Christ fills the immensity of space and is the means by which Christ is able to be in all things and is through all things, is round about all things. It giveth life to all things and is the law by which all things are governed. It is the light that quickeneth man's understanding. In this manner, the light of Christ is related to man's conscience and tells him right from wrong. The light of Christ should not be confused with the personage of the Holy Ghost, for the light of Christ is not a personage at all. Its influence is preliminary to and preparatory to one's receiving the Holy Ghost. John 1.10, and the JSC adds a small piece in here. He, even the Son of God, was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And he came unto his own. Now, I've highlighted own here because the Greek word here pertains to yourself and also to your people. So you could read this. He came unto his own people and his own people received him not. But as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God only to them that believe on his name. Even as changed to only here with the JST. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This word dwelt, I want to talk about it because the Greek word actually means to encamp, to occupy a house, or specifically to reside as God did in the tabernacle of old. It's a symbol of protection and communion. It can be translated as well, that's correct, but it has a much more significant meaning in Greek. It means that like in the tabernacle, like in the temple, God literally dwelt among them. Jesus understands the human condition. A remarkable doctrine is taught here. The same Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, is also one of us. He was human in every aspect, right down to being tempted like other human beings. And because he personally has been tempted, Christ can understand what temptation is. For his own personal experience of the human condition, he understands what we're dealing with here. He can empathize with us and help us overcome temptation just as he overcame it. That's from Stephen E. Robinson. From Bruce R. McConkie. When we accept Christ and join the church, we have power given us to become the sons of God. We are not his sons and daughters by church membership alone, but we have the ability and the capacity and the power to attain unto that status after we accept the Lord with all our hearts. Now, the ordinances that are performed in the temples are ordinances of exaltation. They open the door to us to an inheritance of sonship. They open the door to us so that we may become sons and daughters, members of the household of God in eternity. Back to John 1, verse 16, again from the JST. For in the beginning was the Word, even the Son, who is made flesh, and sent unto us by the will of the Father. And as many as believe on his name shall receive of his fullness, and of his fullness have all we received, even immortality and eternal life through his grace. For the law was given through Moses, but life and truth came through Jesus Christ. 
for the law was after a carnal commandment to the administration of death, but the gospel was after the power of an endless life through Jesus Christ, the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father. This whole verse 18 is a complete add-in by Joseph Smith. In verse 19, there's some significant addition. That would be verse 18 in the King James translation. No man has seen God at any time, except he hath borne record of the Son. For except it is through him, no man can be saved. Now, in the King James Version, it says no man has seen God at any time. Full stop. But that's not what's really meant here. From the Institute Manual. In the scriptures, particularly the Gospel of John, the word see can sometimes mean perceive with our minds or understand. In that light, John 1.18 can be understood to mean that men have not fully seen or understood God. Therefore, Jesus came as God's messenger to declare or reveal to men what God the Father is like. This is a theme throughout the Gospel of John. John 1.19 and this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art there? From the Institute Manual, although the phrase the Jews is rarely used in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John used it 71 times in his gospel. John used this term in several different ways throughout his gospel. The reader should be thoughtful to interpret the term's meaning within its specific context. For example, in John 2, 6, Jews refer to the Jewish people as a race or nation. In John 5, 9, and 18, Jews refers to the leaders of the Sanhedrin, including the chief priests, scribes, and elders. Often in John's gospel, Jews refers to the members of the Jewish nation who felt hostility towards the Savior. This next part, 19 through 28, is John interacting with the priests and Levites who come from Jerusalem to question him. The Jewish leaders asked John if he was Elias, who was prophesied to someday return. In the Joseph Smith translation, the Lord revealed a more complete account of John's response to the Jewish leaders, which conveys John's knowledge of his own mission as one who came to prepare the way for the Messiah. To their queries, John confessed and denied not that he was Elias, but confessed saying, I am not the Christ. John understood as the priest and Levites apparently did not, that there are various meanings for the name title Elias. John was an Elias, which means a forerunner of the Messiah, but he was not the Elias, who is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. John was also not Elijah the prophet, whose name in Greek is Elias. I am not that Elias who was to restore all things. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as saith the prophet Isaiah. John's testimony left no doubt that he knew of his own divinely appointed preparatory mission and of the divinity of the preferred one who would come after him. I baptize with water, but there standeth among you whom you know not. He it is of whom I bear record. He is the prophet, even Elias, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose, or whose place I am not able to fill. For he shall baptize not only with water, but with fire, and with the Holy Ghost. When John denied that he was Elijah, the Jewish leaders asked him, Are thou that prophet? Their question likely had reference to the prophecy of Moses in Deuteronomy. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. However, by asking John if he was that prophet, after John had already denied that he was the Christ, these Jews showed that they did not understand the messianic nature of Moses' prophecy. Many of the Jews in Jesus' day anticipated the coming of a prophet who would be like unto Moses, who was not the Messiah. This is evident when many in Jerusalem later proclaimed that Jesus Christ was the prophet, while others declared that he was the Christ. John 1.29 The next day John seeing Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Notice it says sin singular, not sins, as we sometimes incorrectly quote this. John is the only New Testament writer to use the Lamb as a title for the Savior. Twice in the Gospel of John, Jesus is called the Lamb of God, and the title of the Lamb appears over 20 times in the book of Revelation. From President Nelson, the Old Testament has many references to atonement, which called for an animal sacrifice. 
not any animal would do. Special considerations included the selection of a firstling of the flock without blemish, the sacrifice of the animal's life by shedding of its blood, the death of the animal without breaking a bone, and one animal could be sacrificed as a vicarious act for another. The atonement of Christ fulfilled these prototypes of the Old Testament. He was the firstborn lamb of God without blemish. His sacrifice occurred by the shedding of blood. No bones of his body were broken. Noteworthy in that both malefactors crucified with the Lord had their legs broken. They did that to ensure that they would die sooner. And his was a vicarious sacrifice for others. Verse 30. This is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. Verse 33 is changed by the GST because it says, I knew him not. But the GST says, and I knew him for he who sent me to baptize with water. The same said unto me, upon whom thou seest the spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Some scholars have suggested that the not knowing him might refer to the fact that he hadn't received up until that time a witness that he was a Messiah. John 1, 28. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. From the Institute Manual, Nephi prophesied that John would baptize in Bethabara, beyond Jordan even that he should baptize the Messiah. It is thought that the Savior was baptized near the place where the Jordan River enters the Dead Sea. This area is also approximately where Joshua miraculously led the ancient Israelites out of their exile in the desert across the Jordan River into the Promised Land. Geographically, this is the lowest freshwater location on earth. From President Nelson, the River Jordan was the site Jesus chose for his baptism. It is significant that this sacred ordinance was performed in virtually the lowest body of fresh water on the planet. Could he have selected a better place to symbolize the humble depths to which he went and from which he rose? By example, he taught us that he literally descended beneath all things to rise above all things. Surely being baptized after the manner of his baptism signifies that through our obedience and effort, we too can come from the depths to ascend to lofty heights of our own destiny. To us, the River Jordan is a sacred stream. The Jordan marked the termination of the wandering of the children of Israel. They had journeyed there from the banks of the Nile. Joshua had led some 600,000 Israelite warriors and their families across the rolling river during flood season, when the waters were suddenly stopped and heaped up to allow the faithful Israelites carrying the Ark of the Covenant to cross an empty riverbed. Bethabara, in Hebrew means house of the crossing. Could it be that Christ chose this location for his baptism in the river Jordan as a silent commemoration of the crossing of those faithful Israelites under Joshua's direction so many years before, as well as the symbol that baptism is a spiritual crossing into the kingdom of God? Verse 35. And again, the next day, after John stood in two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? And he said unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. From Elder Holland, you will recall that when Andrew and another disciple, probably John, first heard Christ speak, they were so moved and attracted to Jesus, that they followed him as he left the crowd. Sensing that he was being pursued, Christ turned and asked the two men, What seek ye? Other translators rendered that simply, what do you want? They answered, where dwellest thou? Or where do you live? Christ said, simply come and see. 
Just a short time later, he formally called Peter and, and other new apostles with the same spirit of invitation. To them, he said, come follow me. It seems that the essence of our mortal journey and the answers to the most significant questions in life are distilled down to these two very brief elements in the opening scene of the Savior's earthly ministry. One element is the question put to every one of us. What seek ye? What do you want? The second is his response to our answer, whatever the answer is. Whoever we are and whatever we reply, his response is always the same. Come, he says lovingly. Come follow me. Wherever you are going, first come and seek what I do. See where and how I spend my time. Learn of me. Walk with me. Talk with me. Believe. Listen to me pray. In turn, you will find answers to your own prayers. God will bring rest to your souls. Come follow me. Elder Soros said, When we accept the Savior's invitation to come and see, we need to abide in him, immersing ourselves in the scriptures, rejoicing in them, learning his doctrine, and striving to live the way he lived. Only then will we come to know him, Jesus Christ, and recognize his voice, knowing that as we come unto him and believe in him, we shall never hunger nor thirst. We will be able to discern the truth at all times, as occurred to those two disciples who abode with Jesus that day. John 1, 42. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. And if you look at the actual Hebrew word, Cephas, it is of Chaldean origin or Babylonian origin, means the rock or stone. It's the surname of Peter. But if you do a deeper dive, and if you look at the JST, Cephas, which is by interpretation a seer or a stone, a seer stone. And they were fishermen, and they straightway left all and followed Jesus. From Bruce R. McConkie, destined to stand as the president of the Church of Jesus Christ and to exercise the keys of the kingdom in their fullness, Peter was to be a prophet, seer, and revelator. Foreshadowing this later call, Jesus here confers a new name upon his chief disciple, the name Cephas, which means a seer or a stone. Adding significance will soon be given this designation when in promising him the keys of the kingdom, our Lord will tell Peter that the gates of hell shall never prevail against the rock of revelation, or in other words, against seership. Seers are specially selected prophets who are empowered to know past, present, and future things, a gift which is greater no man may have. Verse 43, the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find Philip. And saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. From the Institute Manual. Philip and the other disciples were able to recognize Jesus as the Messiah because they had been searching the scriptures for signs of the Messiah. The law was the first five books of Moses, while the prophets were the books such as Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, and Zechariah. Later in his ministry, Jesus commanded his listeners to search the scriptures, which were the books of the Old Testament in his day because they testified him and were so blessed to have just studied for a whole year these prophecies in the Old Testament. From the Institute Manual, Nazareth was a small village of approximately two to 400 residents, situated 15 miles west of the Sea of Galilee and 20 miles east of the Mediterranean. Archaeological remains indicate that no paved roads existed in the village, nor did any significant social, political, or economic activity occur there. While Nazareth was commonly thought of as insignificant, by many people during the Savior's time, it became known later in the New Testament time as the hometown of the Redeemer of mankind. Nathaniel's question about whether any good thing could come from Nazareth reflected the thinking of many others. From President Monson, from Nazareth came he who made blind men to see, lame beggars to walk, even the dead to live. He set before us an example to emulate. He lived the perfect life. 
He taught the glad tidings that changed the world. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? From Nazareth came example, sight, strength, life, faith, peace, courage. From Nazareth came Christ. Verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile or deceit or fraud. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. I wonder what happened. I don't know for sure, but I get this feeling that something special happened under the fig tree. Jesus answered and said unto him, this is verse 50, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. This verse can also be read as a statement rather than a question. It could be read, Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, you believe. Greater things than these you will see. From Elder Holland, whoever we are and whatever we reply to the Lord's invitation, his response is always the same. Come, he says lovingly. Come follow me. Wherever you are going, first come to see what I do. See where and how I spend my time. Learn of me. Walk with me. Talk with me. Believe. Listen to me pray. In turn, you will find answers to your own prayers. God will bring rest to your souls. Come follow me. This next little excerpt is from Frederick W. Farrar from a book called The Life of Christ. Today, too, that question, can any good thing come out of Nazareth, is often repeated. And the one sufficient answer, almost the only possible answer, is now as it was then, come and see. Then it meant come and see one who speaks as never man spake. Come and see one who, though he be of the carpenter of Nazareth, yet overawes the souls of all who approach him, seeming by his mere presence to reveal the secrets of all hearts, yet drawing to him even the most sinful with a sense of yearning love. Come and see one from whom there seems to breathe forth the irresistible charm of a sinless purity, the unapproachable beauty of divine life. Come and see, said Philip, convinced in his simple, faithful heart that to see Jesus was to know him. And to know him was to love, and to love was to adore. In this sense, indeed, we can say, come and see no longer. For his earthly form has been visible no more. But there's another sense, no less powerful for conviction, in which it still suffices to say in answer to all doubts, come and see. Come and see a dying world revivified, a decrepit world regenerated, an aged world rejuvenescent. Come and see the darkness illuminated, the despair dispelled. Come and see tenderness brought into the cell of the imprisoned felon, and liberty to the fettered slave. Come and see the dens of lust and tyranny transformed into sweet and happy homes, defiant atheists into believing Christians, rebels into children, and pagans into saints. And as you see them all, it may be that you too will unlearn the misery of doubt and exclaim in calm and happy confidence with the pure and candid Nathaniel, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou, thou art the King of Israel. Brothers and sisters, I know it went a little bit long today, but this John chapter 1 is an incredible chapter. I hope you've enjoyed some of the things that we've talked about today. Please continue your reading. Have a great week.